Well, thanks very much for inviting me along as, as well. And uh, I mean, uh, um, I think uh, often it's difficult to sort of uh, gauge what audience uh, one is uh, communicating with. Uh, I mean, certainly, uh, um, I, 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 I wouldn't make any, uh, any excuses to be, uh, have anything associated with uh, architectural design expertise uh, in any way. And in fact, um, one of the things that uh, um, I'm sort of writing against and talking against in some way is uh, various forms of reductivism, um, either to pure um, aspects of design or about uh, economics or about social or, or, or cultural. Um, so I'm very much in favour of, uh, of trying to engage in a, in a sort of uh, um, hybrid notion of what makes things work and also what makes cities work. And I guess the context uh, for uh, what I've got to say um, is the way in which uh, creativity or culture um, has been picked up as the sort of uh, the, the general fix-it um, for, um, for, for anything that's wrong at the moment, yeah? um, and particularly cities. Um, and if you add this label before them, somehow it makes them better. Um, certainly, uh, um, it's one of the things that people find difficult to disagree with. Um, I mean, politicians particularly um, always like to have their photograph uh, store, uh, in, in front of uh, uh, a brand new building, uh, for example, or a new opera house or, or whatever, um, and you know, conveniently disappear when the lights go out and there's not enough uh, revenue funding for the, uh, uh, for the performers in, the, in any way. Um, but it's all right because another, um, another administration will be in power then. Um, so there is a real issue here about, um, about the, uh, um, the appearance of, uh, of culture, um, the appearance of, uh, of creativity as, uh, as the sort of fix it, um, and actually what goes on. Um, and partly, um, I guess, what I'm talking about uh, today is a, a particular strand of uh, argumentation um, that has been uh, abroad in the past uh, five years or so um, that uh, comes under the rubric of uh, creative cities um, or the creative class, uh, particularly um, from Richard Florida's work, um, that has been picked up um, to, um, in a sense, bring a lot of work in its train. Um, to a certain extent, um, design and architecture. Um, to a certain extent, um, um, cultural practitioners. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, planners. And to a certain extent, um, regeneration agencies as well. Okay? Um, there's a sense in which um, the um, cultural creative economy um, is, uh, is, is like sort of philanthropy, you know, a 1%. You, know, you have a regeneration scheme, and you have the 1% for culture. Um, that, uh, that somehow sort of makes it all fine, gives a feel-good factor, and everyone thinks that uh, it's wonderful. Um, and then, of course, part of the problem is with this whole area um, is that then somebody comes along with a clipboard and says, OK, so what were the deliverables from the cultural elements of that program? How many jobs did you create? Um, you know, how, et cetera, et cetera. How much money did you create? And, of course, it all goes pear-shaped then. And, of course, well, of course, culture failed because artists... Huh, what do you expect? You know, they, um, so there's a, there's a real tension here in terms of what is it that culture and creativity can do? Um, what's its relationship with cities? Um, what's its relationship um, with, with urban development, uh, basically? Because that's, I guess, where this, uh, um, this issue comes together. It's about um, this relationship between urban development and the cultural fix in some way. And I guess this links to a sort of uh, dominantly sort of economic um, type of argument that's, uh, that, that's, that's very popular um, and drives these sorts of issues uh, invariably, which is that, of course, we're in a sort of global economy um, and therefore what we're engaged in is um, a war of position, basically. It's competition, okay? And what's your competitive advantage, okay? And cities, you know, cities, cities, you know, 50% of the world is cities now, so everyone's got a city. Um, so what is it that distinguishes you? What's your USP? Okay, uh, what's your unique selling proposition? Um, is it uh, a concert hall? Um, obviously, you know, there's one possibility is that you create um, things, a new building. Um, 
culture um, apparently is something that, uh, that seems to be a little individual and therefore you can sell yourself on the basis of being different and therefore hence the uh, um, salience of this notion of culture and creativity. Right, let me move on in terms of, of sort of narrowing down a bit. Specifically, I want to talk about Richard Florida's work. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Richard Florida's work, um, but uh, um, Richard Florida wrote this book um, called The Creative Class, The Rise of the Creative Class. Um, and uh, He's paid shed loads of money to uh, basically come and talk to people about uh, creative cities. Everyone and everyone um, wants to invite him along because they hope they can get a bit of the star attraction that will then sort of make their self a, a, a creative city. And the genius of what he did, um, in a way, was to create a ranking, okay, and uh, a ranking of the most creative cities in the world. And of course, you know, sort of any um, city authority, of course, would want to be number one, or would want to or employ him to uh, to change the ranking in some way, or to find out how they could be number number one um, instead of number two or number three or number 157 or, or whatever. Okay, so in this world of creating on image, um, competing by image, um, clearly, how what it is that constitutes the, uh, if you like, the fairy dust of uh, creativity um, is, uh, is important. And in a sense, um, Florida offered many unfortunate politicians and policy makers um, some, uh, some snake oil, basically. Um, this is how you measure it, and this is how you can become it. Okay. Um, what I want to say a little bit uh, in, 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 uh, in a few minutes is that's not quite what you said. Um, and also that uh, there are some problems with that uh, uh, as well. Um, and this may t seem like an esoteric point, but um, I have to tell you that the, the, the power of Florida's rhetoric has had huge buy-in politically and with, uh, with, with uh, urban mayors around the world. Yeah? This is something to be uh, confronted with um, because this is driving many agendas. Okay? The idea that, uh, that cities will be driven by, reborn through creativity uh, in some way. Okay, and of course, some, many of the problems with uh, Richard Florida's idea of the creative class, um, of course, this is, happens to be the middle classes or a section of the middle classes, very much like you and I, um, who in fact are the saviour of all cities and will transform all cities um, uh, through their creativity um, and, uh, and, and save them and make them, make them big and new and, and shiny once again. Okay, so it's, a, a, in a sense, a very self-serving argument and a very attractive argument uh, for, for buying. But unfortunately, um, one of the problems with it, uh, as I'll point out, um, is that it focuses on consumption. And it actually doesn't focus on culture and creativity. And this l ties in to another line um, that I have a problem with, um, is this sort of turn to cultural consumption as the saviour of, uh, of cities. Um, too much imbalance there. So I'll come back and talk about that. And furthermore, it's targeted at place marketing, basically. And this is an old story about cities of place marketing, of, of, of selling basically, selling your city um, one against another. Um, and of course, as we all know, it's a zero-sum game. Okay? Um, unless you win, of course, then you're very happy because you, you, you steal from everybody else. But place marketing um, is a very destructive um, strategy. And of course, it's a very expensive one and, and a very inefficient one uh, uh, as well because uh, um, you're constantly rebranding yourself, remaking yourself, building uh, yet another art gallery um, out of an old power station next to a river with a bridge over it. Not be many of those, have they? Um, and uh, so there's this idea that uh, that somehow there's a, there's a there's a there's a, uh, a template in some way, but also it constantly um, uh, has to be uh, reinvigorated. On the other side of it, um, uh, uh, well, part part of the attraction of that, of course, I just need to mention, is the fact that it, it, it plays to the idea that uh, I think we'd all sort of want to say is that if you add some of the um, something beyond the the, the grimy materialism, um, add some uh, um, some design, add some uh, um, some creative input to things, then they will naturally be better in some way. Okay, um, so there's a part. I mean, yes, you want to go with that, but um, actually underlying it 
is uh, this grimy uh, world of uh, simply selling yourself better than somebody else. One of the other points that I have a big problem with this is that it actually ignores the people that do it. Okay, the creatives, the artists, etc. Okay, um, and uh, the, the trendy term for these at the moment is the cultural industries or the creative industries, and we can talk more about that um, if you like. Um, but actually, it ignores this whole area of production about how these ideas get produced. Um, so it's simply about selling um, um, finished things. Another group of, uh, of criticisms of this sort of argument come from a more traditional sphere, which partly through the Frankfurt School and Adorno and Horkheimer and sort of that uh, um, commercialism is bad, is the very opposite of this pure essence that is art and culture in some way. And therefore, um, the, um, the, this, this focus on, uh, uh, on culture and cities must be about bread and circuses. It's about neoliberalism and consumption, and therefore it's bad in some way. Okay, so again, an overdrawn argument, um, but there are, there are various, various lines that come into this um, that uh, I think we need to pick our ways uh, through. So the question is, is it exclusively a consumption phenomenon? Um, is it simply the candy floss of the experience economy, as it's uh, also trendily called uh, uh, by people? Is there something more to the creative city? And I guess, from my point of view, um, can something be recovered from it? Um, is, it, is it all bad? There's some good and bad in it. Of course there is. Um, it's, the, the key issue is to, to try to tease out uh, what might, that might be. Um, and certainly my conclusion is going to be about uh, the need to re-engage with uh, what, in a very general sense, I call cultural production. Um, it's about how culture is, is produced and reproduced, the conditions for that, um, rather than simply um, buying and selling um, finished articles. And what I'd certainly argue is that one of the things that we need to recognize about cities is that they are very effective places for bringing together um, producers and consumers in the uh, um, sort of activity that uh, I guess in terms of Web 2.0 is called prosumption, but it's about the way that producers and consumers interact with one another. It's about the stuff that happens in cities. It's about the interaction, exchange of knowledge about the knowledge of things, okay? which um, certainly is one of the points that I'd argue is the function increasing that cities are playing, not simply as a place of buying and selling, but as a place of exchange of knowledge. Okay? Right. Okay, that's uh, sort of the broad uh, prospectus. Uh, just to whiz through a, a, a number of the things, let's, let's just uh, take on board um, the issue about uh, Richard Florida's uh, work. And it is tremendously important, uh, as I uh, suggest, um, because it, it has, uh, has caught such a, uh, um, an imagination, a public imagination, and also a policy and political imagination that unfortunately seems to be driving many other, uh, other things. And uh, his argument, and I think it, it sort of one needs to actually sort of find what exactly is he arguing. He's arguing that uh, um, that the thing that uh, that makes successful cities now um, is a combination of three factors, and he calls them conveniently the three T's: um, technology, talent, and tolerance. Okay, and uh, if you, as he does, create some sort of uh, metric um, that brings all these together, um, then at the top of the pile is San Francisco. Okay, um, and uh, it's below that are a whole range of cities, um, but it's about this fortuitous combination um, of uh, talent, um, tolerance, and technology. Okay. So it's high technology activity, um, it's a tolerant city administration that is open to diversity, um, etc. Uh, one part of Florida's uh, um, algorithm, if you like, is uh, um, notoriously a, a gay index, and, and the higher on that you are, the, 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 uh, the better your city um, does. But it, this is really about, about um, diversity and tolerance, and, and making that point that, of course, had been noted many times before, that, that uh, more diverse cities tend to have more resources to, to bring to the table in terms of, of these activities. However, this is a fairly reductive approach, reduced to a number of key metrics. Okay? 
So, uses this as a basis for ranking cities, okay? Um, and thereby does one of the things that's very important in, uh, in, in policy making and politics at the moment. He provides an apparent evidential base um, for policy making, okay? Um, now, of course, one would always want to look below the, the surface of, of any sort of uh, um, indication. Florida's work, for example, um, uh, if you look at uh, some of the components of it, uh, are rather questionable. Um, when they try to reproduce it for uh, Europe, um, unfortunately, it didn't work because there's no way of actually there's there's, there's no gay index. You know, it, I mean, it's not something you put on your census form or, or whatever. Um, they used telephone surveys, etc. So it's a real problem in terms of which is a real problem, issues, uh, about actually how do you measure diversity? How do you, how do you try to engage with those things that are seen as a positive good um, in terms of their interrelationship, in terms of questioning values, etc.? Okay? Um, so these sorts of issues. But what I want to take issue with more is that we, I mean, you, you could really go to town on taking apart many of these uh, measures. Um, I just have to tell you one other whilst I, I go along. If you've ever read Douglas Adams' Restaurant at the End of the Universe, um, the uh, story, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's a third one, I think. Um, and basically, as part of that, um, he, the, the author sends these two spaceships off into space uh, and uh, one of them um, has uh, um, all of these uh, people on board who actually turn out to be all of the middle managers and the hairdressers and the uh, nail cosmeticians and etc etc okay sort of uh, now it's very interesting if you look at his list of those because it almost exactly equates to Richard Florida's list of the creative class actually it's a rather unfortunate comparison but <laughs> um, there is a there is a problem of drawing these things too widely, okay? Um, so there's a, a question of, uh, of exactly what you go on there. But what I'm really concerned with is, is what's lying underneath um, Florida's argument. So what is he really arguing here about the transformation of cities? And, uh, and is there something we can take out from that and learn from it and, and apply it? We may use different indicators in some way. Is there something to learn um, there? And it's this conceptual account and it's this issue that is associated with the role, the proactive role of a particular class fraction um, that is important um, in Florida's account and also the fact that actually what he says um, is not the story that we often hear from this is that somehow it's those people that remake a city actually it's a story about high technology we'll see in a moment Neoliberalism um, and place marketing, the idea that, uh, that cities you have to sell themselves because, of course, there's no manufacturing, no jobs or whatever. All the jobs that there, there are, will come are through mobile investment and therefore you have to prostitute yourself on the global economy and say that I'm better, come here, um, do this, um, come to our city. So it's about footloose industry and it's about consumption because you focus on the decision makers, um, therefore um, it's the CEOs and what are the CEOs interested in? They're interested in allegedly opera and uh, high culture, etc. Therefore, build an opera house and um, put on lots of, uh, um, of, uh, of particular forms of uh, sort of populist but not too frightening classical music and uh, yeah, attract them. So it's a middle brow high culture in, in a way. Yeah? Um, so it's all this sort of stuff. And it's also based upon more fundamental issues about sort of where our economy is going. You know, and there's this idea implanted in this that you know, we had agriculture, then it was in industry, and then it was knowledge economy, and now it's, now it's creative economy. Yeah? And, and as part of this rather facile argument is, is, is part of the, the issue here is that anything that's got the creative economy in it must be good. It's the next big thing. And of course, you know, as somebody responsible for managing a city or managing part of a city, um, you wouldn't want to be accused of not jumping on the next bang bargain in some way, or you miss that one. Yeah, in some way. So there is a problem here. Now there are all sorts of issues about, you know, is this some sort of, uh, um, you know, necessary ladder that everybody goes along, or, 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 or is it a rather more complicated uh, process here? This is tends to be underneath um, all of this argument and, and uh, repays uh, a little more questioning, I think. The other element um, is about uh, cultural uh, consumption. Um, is talked about very much in terms of not culture, 
The Mercer Index, which I'm sure you've all come across at some point, whether knowingly or not, is whenever once a year um, the newspapers have said that the most attractive city to go and live in is Vancouver or Zurich or Sydney. Yeah, that's the Mercer Index, okay? And it measures the quality of life in cities. And of course, every city would want to be top of the Mercer Index because why is the Mercer Index, why does it exist? Yeah, it's marketed to CEOs and those that are involved in uh, relocating companies, okay, to see which will keep their staff happy uh, and also their, 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 their co-managers as well or their, their upper middle managers or whatever it is that they want to move around, okay? So quality of life. Now, there's an issue here of, of culture not being part of this quality of life. It's normally about the, the amount of um, dog shit on the street and the, whether the rubbish is collected or whatever. That's the sort of thing that tends to be measured in this. Okay? Um, so maybe you can add the number of art galleries or whatever for a particular um, audience. Um, so this is a question. Is it simply another element of, uh, of playing into this bigger argument about, well, you know, can we just sell ourselves against somebody else? And uh, you know, if we get a new street cleansing department in, then that we can get up the rankings in some way or get a few extra galleries along. You know, this doesn't seem quite connected to, to uh, um, the bigger vision in, in some way. But this is, this is what's going on, partly. And I think that this, it's to be aware of when people mention this word culture, um, you know, people say, reach for your gun. You know, it's, it's like sort of when they mention this term, they're often tying in to this set of arguments. And, and they're not about uh, the things that I'm going to talk about, which I, I'd argue is issues about cultural production. Okay, they're, these things about cultural production are seen as having an indirect impact. This is a huge problem in, in many respects because, uh, um, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, determines and governs uh, um, many policy and strategic decisions are assumptions about economics. And one of the major flaws of, uh, of economics is the idea that uh, somehow the, the whole of the service sector, um, and certainly the cultural sector, is seen as somehow dependent on the manufacturing sector. Okay? So, so anything that happens as a result of culture or consumption is somehow, it's always going to be inferior. Um, it's always a sort of bit of an add-on and it's not real activity, um, etc. So the whole area, the idea that you could mobilize the future of a city through issues about consumption or about culture um, seems uh, like uh, um, something imaginary. You know, it's not going to work. It's a, it's a bubble economy in some way. Okay? So, but I think we need to re-examine that and actually have a look at that relationship. And I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a second. One of the other issues about uh, Florida's uh, work, one that is very popular, is the idea that there is this group of people called the creative class that he argues are, are the, the proactive group. And uh, Florida takes this idea um, almost directly um, and, and renames it um, from Daniel Bell's work. Um, and of course, Manuel Castells takes his work almost directly from Daniel Bell's work as well in terms of, of notions of, uh, uh, about uh, class structure and change. And it's these issues that the idea that the class would play an important uh, role um, in terms of, uh, of, a, of an active agent um, in some way. Um, of course, interestingly, Daniel Bell, um, uh, I'm sure you're aware, post-industrial society, was written just before the, uh, the, uh, the oil crisis of, the, of 1973 or whatever. It was, it was written before but published afterwards and, and probably why uh, it became very unpopular um, shortly afterwards because he was sort of period of, we've had, never had it so good, it's a further expansion, we move into this knowledge economy and uh, the rise of the, uh, of the scientific and the technocratic class and everything's going to be fine after that and then all of a sudden you know, the book's published and then there's an oil crash and everything goes down. So it didn't look as though it was, uh, it was a good scenario. But clearly um, it's a good story. Okay? It's a good story about the future of the knowledge economy and this is where it comes from. The idea that somehow knowledge is going to save us rather than manufacturing and even dear old Margaret Thatcher was um, concerned with, uh, with, with that argumentation um, in, the, in, in the early 80s in terms of the reorganization uh, of economies um, here. So what is it about this creative class? What is it that they actually do uh, in some way? Um, 
Florida's work uh, and, uh, and uh, drawing on, on, on Bell's work is, is not about that they do something, as a, but it's simply about certain occupations and that they have certain cultural values. Later work of, uh, of Daniel Bell's was quite interesting um, because he talked about the cultural crisis of capitalism. Okay, um, Bell was uh, concerned and interested in this sort of proactive role that the uh, um, that the uh, um, the middle classes, the technocratically educated middle classes, um, would play in society, and that therefore governments would have to appease them, basically, provide their kids with education, um, they'd have to provide them with uh, with mass cultural um, experiences, etc., to keep them happy, etc. Um, but also um, um, Bell recognized that there was also a problem, that these people may turn against you in some way, um, that somehow they may get too creative uh, in some way. And this was his cultural crisis of capitalism. And interestingly, um, if you have a look at uh, some of the work that's uh, um, written about broader cultural changes, and particularly about the rise of advertising, um, particularly in the US, is very much how advertising managed to ride this contradiction in some way, and actually um, develop the idea of radical consumption in some way, that you can uh, wear your rebellion on your lapel, you know, and make it trendy uh, in some way, rather than, um, than rebellion being a real um, um, challenge to the system, but it becomes incorporated, or as the situationist used to say, recuperated, the idea that rebellion itself can be sold. Okay, um, so advertising, particularly the development of advertising in the U.S. in the 1960s, um, was very much about um, drawing in um, the counterculture and then selling it back. Okay, and this is to an extent um, what Bell missed yeah, in, in this sense, the way that it becomes uh, all part of a of a larger consumption um, story. Florida here is concerned with this new scientific class um, and about cultural consumption because he's saying that there's this huge growing class that uh, um, have new consumption needs and basically whichever cities provide for those new consumption needs then people will go there and we'll see why that's important um, in a second. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me just uh, zip on beyond that. Uh, I've got a few points to say here. Is that, that basically, interestingly, um, Florida's building on this argument that uh, what is it that makes cities uh, grow and develop? The thing that makes them grow and develop is their investment in the knowledge economy, in high tech development. Okay? And his observation is that uh, high tech development. Um, basically now is drawn to its labor yeah? because labor is important now and particularly specifically skilled labor and therefore high-tech industries will go to where its labor wants to be and its labor is attracted to tolerant cities etc etc yeah? and therefore the way to attract high-tech industries is to attract its labor yeah? Um, and it's, what's its labor interested in consuming? And this is the nub of Florida's argument, basically, is that they're interested in consuming um, culture. Okay? And there are uh, particular types of, of, of culture. So the whole sort of thing is built upon this edifice, in some way, of, uh, of, of selling consumption. And actually, um, this is not so different at all to the same argument that's been uh, trailed out um, in terms of, uh, of high technology or biotechnology or nanotechnology or science parks or whatever. You know? How do you promote your region, city or whatever? You make it a science city, you make it a biotech city or whatever, as if no one else has thought of that one. Um, and it's this sort of thing, the relocation game. Flagship properties, you know, if it was a science park, you would have a, 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 a green campus with a duck pond or whatever, and a few glass buildings or, or whatever, sort of, that sort of uh, argument. In this case, uh, with culture, um, it's, a, as I say, a few converted uh, um, um, power stations and uh, an art galleries, etc. Same sort of uh, facile argument. And in the way, in the way that the science parks argument um, failed, so did so is the, uh, the the creative cities argument because science parks were based on a, a fairly you know sensible premise in the idea that um, 
The new innovation and development of ideas um, often um, requires um, lots of iterations and feedback between various stages of uh, idea making and production, etc. And therefore, in a sense, the ideal um, type um, of uh, activity was like a common room in some way, where people would discuss freely their ideas about application and uh, about uh, um, uh, unapplicable ideas, and there will be some meeting together and, and, and there will be new spin-offs um, developing from that. That's the idea of a science park, and many of the uh, original ones were based on the idea that there would be this meeting place. And then, of course, property development takes over. And, of course, uh, it's about managing a property portfolio, and uh, you're not interested in having a, the right balance of uh, tenants. You're simply interested in making sure there's a rental return on the development. Um, thus it was with science parks, and to an extent, the same thing with, with, with culture uh, in this way. They say you have the right buildings, but you don't have the activity that actually animates them in some way. So Florida's idea is very attractive um, because first, it's selling to high-tech firms and selling to the high-tech future. So, so if, you know, that, that's an attractive one for, for any policymaker, new jobs, the future jobs, etc. Okay? And you can have some culture as well, and you can justify your cultural budget by saying we're attracting these high-tech companies. Okay? Um, and, but actually, it's simply selling a version of culture. Okay, um, and selling a, a consumption of culture um, and a, a, a sort of like a Disneyland culture rather than one that's, that's very active. It's not looking at what actually makes that culture um, work. Furthermore, um, Florida's work is based on some uh, um, rather um, tedious uh, um, economic theory as well, which is called human capital mobility theory. Um, that's uh, what is it attracts people to places, um, and uh, that um, basically Glazer's work is what Florida uh, draws on here. And basically, he's saying that uh, how, why do cities grow? Um, it's partly because they have more intelligent people. Um, how do you have more intelligent people? You invest in education or invest in culture that attracts um, those people. Um, so it's about a correlation. Uh, it's not about causal relationship, but that's the argument in some way. Um, and it's, I say, it leads into this new twist on place marketing, um, that you can deliver people to high-tech firms if you have the cultural spin on them. Both of these ideas are about consumption. Um, they're based on um, simply selling to people that are going to do further consumption. Okay? They're not sustainable. It's a bit like cultural gentrification in some way. You sort of uh, um, um, develop um, this uh, cultural cell of, of the place or you remake um, your, your city in a, in a smacker of, uh, of um, well, probably of San Francisco, actually, um, and, uh, and therefore people uh, will come. We need to look at cultural production, I think, I'd argue. And part of this ties in to another um, um, weak point um, for many um, policymakers at the, at the current moment, and that's the, the weakness for creativity. Um, they think that, uh, yeah, we'll have a bit of creativity, that'll, that'll help us. Partly based upon a, 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 an argument um, that uh, somehow, okay, we've got competition, so what's the next stage beyond competition? You can do things cheaper, um, or you can do things of a better quality, um, or maybe you can be creative and create a new product. Yeah? So creativity. Who would not want creativity? It's the next stage of competition. It's the sort of argument that it's uh, all part of. So this has been part of what's driving this idea of the creative industries. Um, and the focus here inappropriately, I think, is on the idea of creativity um, rather than industry. Um, uh, if one was being uh, the tiniest bit cruel, you could say, so which industry is not creative? And who would want to be not creative uh, in some way? It's, it's, it's too much of a coverall uh, uh, term in some way. It doesn't actually look at what's, um, what's going on here. Um, certainly, there is a strand of work, uh, which I associate myself with, which is more about actually trying to understand how the cultural economy um, is playing 
um, in uh, in uh, economists and societies these days. And um, one of the one of the points that comes out very very strongly is that this somewhat neglected area of activity, you know, the stuff producing computer games and films and television, etc., actually is one of the fastest growing parts of the economy. Um, it's something around about sort of six or seven percent of the economy, um, which incidentally, um, at a European level, is bigger than the car industry and the chemicals industry. Okay, so actually maybe it might be important, and actually it's still growing, whereas those other industries aren't. Okay, so there's something about the cultural economy that we don't understand. Um, we need to understand. It doesn't equate with this sort of uh, um, rather superficial reading of creativity. Okay, there's a mismatch there. But clearly, there is some potential linkage there. You know? Creativity is one word. Innovation is is another uh, as well. And of course, every uh, every policymaker is very keen on innovation, uh, just in the way that uh, creativity seems the solution to to everybody's problem. So so is innovation. We'll we'll create something new and uh, and sell it. One of the problems is with both of these terms, and as we all know about uh, about culture, is that despite. Um, what we often um, discuss is that there are some absolute values. Most of these things are in fact uh, embedded in particular places and times. So a film is good this week but not next week. Uh, it's good to release it this week or not next week. Or uh, um, There are changing fashions in terms of what's good art or bad art or, or whatever. They're situated rather than a universal um, value. Um, and it's this process in part that, uh, that gives it uh, the, uh, um, the spin that keeps it, uh, keeps it uh, developing in order for people to um, constantly try to engage um, with, uh, with where the cutting edge is in some way. Florida doesn't engage with issues about the creative process um, and about the creative industries uh, to an extent. It, as, I, as I'll just point out uh, very briefly, um, he's concerned with a whole set of issues um, around, uh, uh, around the, the consumption of culture. Many of these issues, I think, that, that do affect how cities are growing, because they are quantitatively um, important and qualitatively important, much of the culture and creative industries are focused in cities as well, so they're becoming a larger part of, 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 uh, of, of urban economies. Even in London, um, if you look at the size of the economy, and obviously you've got financial services um, that, of course, are dominant, but number three is the cultural economy. Okay? So, in one of the most significant global cities in the world, the cultural economy is the third greatest component. Okay? Um, yet, somehow it gets overlooked. It's not significant. It's not important in some way. Um, and furthermore, it's a tricky customer because it's not only focused on the private sector, it's also in the public sector or vice versa. We often think of it as, as one or the other. Um, Practitioners in the in arts and culture are constantly moving across those boundaries um, and constantly learning from both of them and being uh, um, and 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 working against the disciplines on both sides uh, and that's what uh, often develops their, their their skill. Also between the the formal and the informal and also before the profit and and, and not for profit uh, as well. So it's a sort of interesting area. And again, you know, if we come back to um, um, many understandings of what, what is interesting about cities, if you like, the cityness of cities, it's about all this mixing that's going on. And to, to many extents, it is not surprising that we find the crucible of, uh, of culture and creative industries is in cities because it's where they get, the, if you like, the, the, the oxygen that they need of this mixing and confrontation. Etc., which is always said is the important thing about cities. So part of the, the point I've spent a long, long time coming to, in a way, is you need to create the spaces and places in which people can do this sort of stuff rather than um, create a few fancy art galleries in some way. It's about this informal mixing. It's about the ways in which paths cross. And it's about the ways in which people are able to interchange their activities. It's more than a simple argument for mixed use. Okay? Um, it's about the way that uh, 
one of the important lessons that have come out of, of study of the way that many of the culture and creative industries operate, um, which would be no surprising, uh, surprise to, to, to all of you, is that, you know, um, surprisingly, for uh, many economists anyway, that uh, um, artists don't work in factories. Yeah? You don't go into a factory and everyone's there at their easel and they came in at nine o'clock and clocked in and they're all there. You know? they, they tend to be working self-employed. Yeah? Uh, or that they work in informal networks and, uh, and recontract to those networks. The development of what are called project networks. Okay? And this constant recontracting and re-engagement and the need for um, anybody to be constantly scanning for information about who did what and who did it well and who did it badly, who would you never work with again and who will you always want to work with and how can you possibly work on that project because that will be wonderful, although it won't pay much, but it'll be great for the next part of the career. That sort of stuff, what I call the reputation economy, is vitally important in this area of the, um, the uh, uh, dynamic of the culture and creative industry. It's precisely the sort of thing that uh, um, many successful cities have been very good at creating environments that are allowed um, that sort of activity to, uh, um, to, to, to thrive in. Um, so it's very much about understanding the dynamics of that process. Um, and it's about the shift from an instrumental um, policy for, for culture, instrumental to sell your city, um, instrumental to create uh, some sort of uh, um, appearance um, to something that actually focuses on how people actually do these activities of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cultural um, creation and, and, and recreation. One of the important parts that I've already mentioned about all of this um, is not simply about selling cities, it's not simply about saying that, uh, that we want a bit more extra culture, but it's about actually understanding that there is an intimate relationship in all activities between production and consumption. And what has been effective for the past um, 70 or 80 years has been a process by which you can separate out um, production and consumption um, and, uh, and be very effective at selling the same sort of goods. Okay, very effective um, system. But increasingly, um, the way, well, once you've sold everybody one thing, there's only one, the, you know, you, the, the people aren't going to buy the same thing again unless it looks different. Okay, so you have variegated markets of the same product. So your car comes in different colors with go faster stripes on the side, different engine sizes, different trims, etc., etc. Okay? It's the same item. Um, it's the fact that you may have two toasters, one's a Duralit toaster and one's a regular um, Morphe Richards or, or whatever. Okay? How do you increase consumption? This is what people are interested in. And design clearly is an important part of this. And clearly the so-called culturalization of the economy um, is important. So an increasing part of the survival of economies relies upon this cultural dimension, the design um, dimension of it. Um, and it's about how you encourage this through the development of network building and, uh, um, and not simply um, uh, building flagships um, that uh, um, are there to be, to be seen and commented on uh, rather than actually housing the activities. You need to understand also the sustainability in terms of regions as well. Um, there are issues about, uh, uh, about reinvestment in activities. These need to be sustainable activities. Um, so there are all sorts of issues that concern lots of creative uh, and, and cultural uh, practitioners which are about how it is possible to hang on to their ideas. Um, issues about intellectual property rights, uh, for example. And also the idea that, uh, that somehow you need to um, make this sustainable through creating a strong and diverse infrastructure of, of, of training um, and also to develop a, an environment of critique as well, to develop and hone people's um, skills. 
So these sort of ideas are, if you like, the soft in infrastructure. Um, they counter, to an extent, the idea that simply putting some hard infrastructure, uh, it will solve all these problems. You do get the, um, the end result, invariably, here, where you have uh, very large and impressive buildings um, that, unfortunately, um, don't find um, a, a substantive use for their activities or are, or are underused in some way if you don't have a co-investment in the things that are keep them um, going and, and, and alive. So this creative cities uh, agenda um, shouldn't be focused on simply a few small group of creative uh, people that seem to have a lot of money um, and will buy um, lots of uh, bijo goods. Um, rather, it's part of a reinvigoration of uh, the uh, re-examination of, uh, of the differentiation and value in, in all goods. Um, it's a shift simply from seeing consumption and cities as consumption spaces to back to cities as production spaces and more than that about an interrelationship between production and consumption as, as, as we're all appreciating now that uh, it's not enough to simply um, produce goods um, you have to tailor them um, to future audiences and markets and in fact you have to engage in a relationship with those and of course you know Jonathan Eve and his iPod um, uh, classic example of this sort of interrelationship or if you take the um, designers of uh, uh, at Nokia uh, in terms of, uh, of mobile telephony or, or particularly texting for example um, all these issues are about a co-construction of technologies and users they're about an interrelationship between producers and consumers the sort of thing that happens very effectively um, in cities where you encourage this feedback so the design of cities uh, comes back to this issue of engaging people in more interaction um, engaging them in the opportunity um, to have um, I guess what, uh, what what designers have already or always uh, um, ideally uh, looked for um, is this uh, uh, propinquity of, uh, of people bumping into one another being in the same place and developing relationships uh, uh, um, amongst one another so I think the story here is that creative cities is an attractive idea um, it's, uh, it's an attractive thing that you can sell to people, let's have a bit of creativity. It's popular with politicians and everybody likes a bit of creativity. Okay? Um, but there's more to, um, more to urban development, as we all know, than simply a bit of candy floss on the top. You need some real substance there. Um, paradoxically here, I think, um, the development of the cultural and creative industries and the attention and significance of these sorts of activities and their interrelationship with other parts of society and economy um, are very important that there's something that, uh, that cities have always done well that can be destroyed through redevelopment but also can be encouraged and part of the agenda is trying to understand how many of the, how many of these uh, um, many of these uh, um, activities are drawn to cities because of the very vibrancy of being ex be able to exchange information and knowledge with people and the the very nature of the cultural and creative industries invariably um, is that their markets are very very uncertain and changing very very quickly so therefore the um, saliency of any knowledge about new products, new markets, new things um, is, is, is very short and, and discreet and therefore unless you're in the loop literally um, you're part of the discussion you're hearing what's going on um, then very quickly um, you'll fall out of the activities one of the things that economists say about um, the, uh, the, the culture and creative industries is that they tend to be winner-take-all industries okay so unless you you're one of the you, unless you win the game, then basically you may not have uh, bothered con contributing in some way. So it's like in the charts, okay? If you look at the music charts, the, uh, the top 10 or so sell, mo sell something like 80 or 90% of the, uh, of, the, of the product, okay? Being 100 is really not worth bothering with, okay? Um, and the, and the, a, a lot of these activities are very much like that. So unless you have that cutting edge knowledge, unless you're at the cutting edge, then you may as well give up, okay? Because you're not really going to continue in this business. 
and cities are the, are the place in which the lifeblood of that knowledge exchange takes place. So it's about creating spaces that allow that informal linking, it allows the labour market mobility, allows people to move between jobs, move between places, because that's the sort of employment structures that are important for many of these uh, activities at the moment creates the, um, the uh, uh, physical spaces that allow people to, um, uh, to, uh, um, to redesign their activities. Many of these, uh, these businesses are literally redesigning what it is that they do, creating new business opportunities, business models, or redefining what they do. And of course, blank spaces are, are usually quite useful um, for that. But increasingly, people are moving between jobs and they're, they're, they're self-employed for a short period of time. So it's often the spaces between buildings that are tremendously important. It's about the socialization spaces. It's about, I, mean, I do quite a lot of work on the film television industry in Soho, for example. Okay? So it's the restaurants and the bars that are very, very important. They're an integral part of this activity. We're all here tonight. This is what often it's about. It's about networking and about picking up that bit of information that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, found out. Um, that sort of information becomes tremendously important in these sorts of uh, economies, the economies that ca are characterized by this rather flip label creative cities. The final point is one that uh, I'm sure if uh, Charles Landry had been here, which I'm sure he wish he had been, um, would, have, would have said, well, one of the key points about, uh, about creative cities um, is, uh, from, from his point of view, and, and again counter the, the Florida point, is that parachuting in creativity, parachuting in these ideas, um, never tends to work. Okay? So it's about finding some organic connection with what's there already. Okay, um, finding a connection with what's there and then building on it and developing it. So this is why it's important to, for us to identify the sort of culture and creative activities that are going on, the links between production and consumption that are going on um, at the moment, and try to develop them in some way and look after them. And not, as uh, unfortunately I think has invariably happened in many cities, and London is no exception in this, is that policymakers turning their back on these activities. Okay? Uh, if you speak to policymakers, I know the film industry isn't the be all and end all, but it's still reasonably successful in London, okay? and particularly the special effects industry is very, very successful. It's a world beating industry, okay? although we wouldn't know that and we wouldn't recognize it. Okay? Um, the fact that policymakers in London don't know that, they don't know that, and also they don't know why it is in London and why it might move away tomorrow and how to hang on to it seems a bit of a problem to me because this film special effects industry also is important to the computer games industry and the advertising industry and I'm sure to a lot of what you guys do in this room as well. So, so it's about working out those interconnections. Okay? Um, sometimes they come from strange and wonderful places. Um, but just because they're a bit of candy floss culture does not not mean they're important. They are very, very important. Um, and they're very, very big business. Just to come back to that issue about computer games and film special effects one final time, I bet you didn't realize that the USA's largest export industry is the computer games industry. Okay? Bigger than airplanes. Okay? So it's big business as well, as well as important for all these other reasons, uh, all good reasons and all interesting reasons. Um, it's also big bucks as well um, for some areas of the activity. And I think we need to take those things on board in terms of not just chasing the latest high-tech um, city or the biotech development or whatever and saying yes we'll recreate our city or region in this way by getting this new faculty at the university or whatever but to look in a more organic way about what sort of activities are there but also to pay more attention to culture and creativity um, in cities. The production of culture not simply the consumption of culture. It's not the thing that unfortunately um, the report that uh, we did for the LDA was uh, very much uh, it was a cultural audit of, uh, uh, of London and partly driven by their concern is how do we hang on to the financial services industry? The reason they're here must be because London's culture is good. Um, can we have a report that proves that? 
Okay? It's, they have so missed the point. Okay? Um, but nevertheless, that's the mindset. And I think you know, it's, it's important to engage with both of those points of view about where they are, but to, to really engage with this issue about what's the future for culture in cities. Um, it's not simply what's going to draw people in when they're, when they're hollowed out and there's nothing else there. The only, reason that, you know, the, only, the only reason they're coming in, they're not coming in for their shopping, so they go to Blue Water for that, but they're coming in for some sort of uh, cultural activity. Can you, can you rem keep cities alive? Okay. There's something more than that uh, there. We need to understand that if we want to understand the future of cities. And it's not simply to save cities, but actually it's the future and the dynamism of cities, given that they are um, some of the fastest growing um, areas of, uh, of social and economic life. And they're the source of, of many ideas, which of course is coming back to one of the sort of fundamental points about why people are so passionate about cities. Thanks very much.